Forget about a war on drugs. What about fighting in a war on drugs? Hey guys, welcome to Bent Planet, where I tell you true stories of humans in abnormal predicaments, tales that will twist your mind. And these stories are no exception. And usually I put a lot of effort into a massive edit to go along with the story that I'm telling, but I just wanted to get some stories out quickly for you guys. So. <laughs> Here are three stories about humans being high on drugs in warfare. All right, get comfortable. That was good. I, think <laughs> I actually it. breathed in and snorted oh. flour up my nose. Are you ready to hear a story? Back in the late 80s, a director called Richard Stanley making music videos in the UK became deeply captivated by his Afghan crew members' stories about real life shapeshifters in the rough terrain of the mountains in Afghanistan. Acting on a whim, he decided to go there himself to explore the country and chase down the mythical creatures. It took three attempts. The first was with the UN, but they kicked him out for wandering off their designated trails. The second was through a local fixer, but the fixer was arrested for smuggling heroin. Eventually though, he made it into the country with his cameraman and a war journalist acting as a translator. Stanley packed a bunch of film cameras and set off for an adventure into the wild mountainous terrain. As they hiked, they created detailed maps of the areas they explored. So detailed, in fact, that word quickly spread to local Afghan fighters who asked for their help in fighting off the Russians who were at that time invading Afghanistan. They had already formed a really deep love for the Afghani people, so they quickly accepted and found themselves plunged into military missions. One being to blow up an airport with a missile launcher because the Russians were using it to take off and bomb the resistance. Things went pear-shaped pretty fast and the mission turned into a 24 hour long, extremely violent battle in which the journalist went missing and Stanley's cameraman became seriously wounded, forcing Stanley to carry his shrapnel ridden buddy across the battlefield in an attempt to get them to safety. While under a massive barrage of fire from Russian artillery, Stanley believed he was going to be killed at any moment. So he did what any free-thinking, art-minded, anti-establishment thrill-seeker would do in that situation. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a stash of LSD and threw it all into his mouth, figuring he'd rather go out tripping than in a coherent, straight state of mind. As the artillery rained in on them, Stanley slung his wounded cameraman over the back of a donkey and escaped by walking through a minefield in the middle of the night. He says he made it through because the LSD allowed him to see in the dark and smell the position of the landmines. Oh, and at the time, he was 22 years old. Okay, so being off your chops on drugs while in combat is one thing, but imagine running a war while you're high on substances. Or well, say hello to Hitler. Despite a strong belief in maintaining peak body conditions, Hitler's diet turned from healthy to dangerously addictive over the course of his reign. After hiring a personal doctor by the name of Theo Morell, he began receiving daily vitamin injections to avoid getting sick. But when he was eventually struck down with an illness that stopped him from attending a war meeting, he asked Morell for something stronger, and the doctor obliged by injecting him with opiates. Not surprising, Hitler felt pretty damn good about this and continued getting daily opiate hits to the veins for years along with other top shelf narcotics such as cocaine. Eventually the day came when Hitler realized he had become reliant on the drugs and in anger fired Morel, blaming him for his addiction. At the same time, British bombing destroyed the German factories which produced most of the drugs his body had come to love. Those who have studied videos of Hitler in the last months of his life often refer to his body shakes and tremors as symptoms of drug withdrawals. <sighs> Gobbling down a bunch of methamphetamine drugs before charging into enemy territory would no doubt have its benefits. I mean, if there was ever a time to be high, fearless, alert, and using every ounce of energy possible, fighting in a war sounds appropriate. But as the saying goes, what goes up 
must come down. And just imagine the mental destruction you would be facing after days of not sleeping, using up all that energy, forgetting to eat, and seeing a vicious amount of bloodshed all around you. Whatever you are imagining probably doesn't come close to how Amo Kovanen felt during his massive drug-fueled bender while being hunted down by the enemy in World War II. It was 1944 in Northern Europe and a patrol of Finnish soldiers were being run down by enemy Soviets through harsh winter snow covered mountains. Being a ski patrol, they were all skiing at top speed with their squad leader in front, carving tracks into the snow for them all to follow and glide along. The conditions were horrendous though and in desperation to stay focused and keep his speed up, the leader Aimo reached into his pocket and pulled out a bottle that contained pervitin pills for all of the men in his battalion. And pervitin wasn't just your average antidepressant or energy boosting stimulant, it was pure methamphetamine. The Nazis were renowned for using drugs during warfare, but in reality, troops on both sides of the war were given meth in tablet form to help push their fighting skills when needed. The problem was, Amo didn't have time to take a leisurely snack stop and hand out the pills like candies at Christmas. He had to crack open the bottle and get some pills into his mouth while he was racing at top speed through the snow with enemy bullets racing over his head. His hands were also covered by mittens. So as he attempted to hold the bottle steady and swallow his portion of the pills, he accidentally swallowed the entire supply. Enough methamphetamine for the whole squad to be off their chops wired to the eyeballs. The drugs kicked in fast and so did Aemo's fifth gear. He launched ahead, his brain and body going into overdrive. At first his men kept up and they managed to outpace the Soviets on their tail. But shortly after that, Aemo's mind twisted into a drugged out blur. But it didn't stop him from skiing and skiing and skiing. In fact, it wasn't until the next day that his brain returned to an aware state and he was still skiing. When he stopped to get his bearings, he saw that he was totally alone and he had crossed 100 kilometers, 62 miles of rugged countryside. He had no food, no ammunition and nothing to get him safely through winter nights outdoors in freezing conditions, but he was still under the influence of the meth. So he kept on skiing. Over the course of the next few days, he ran into more Soviets and managed to escape without being killed and skied over a landmine which exploded, sending his mind into a deeper state of delirium. But fueled by an early version of crystal meth, he got up and pushed forward. More days passed with the drugs driving him and eventually hunger pains warned him that his body was breaking down fast. So in desperation, he chewed down pine buds and at one point managed to catch a small bird eating it raw. Unbelievably, Aemo eventually skied into safe Finnish territory without freezing to death in sub-zero temperatures, being killed by Soviets or having a heart attack from the insane amount of meth he digested. When his fellow Finnish compatriots rushed him into a hospital, his heartbeat was still cranking at 200 beats per minute. His weight had dropped to just 42 kilograms, 94 pounds, and he had covered a distance of 400 kilometers, 250 miles while out of his mind on a drug binge. So next time you're feeling some regretties for having a big night out, just think, you haven't come close to old mate Aemo. Alright guys, that's it from Bent Planet. Remember to hit like and subscribe and until the next story, stay bent.